Magic Tree House, Book Number Thirty Four, A Merlin Mission, Season of the Sandstorms, by Mary Pope Osborne. Chapter One, The Golden Age. Jack put his math homework aside. He opened the drawer beside his bed and pulled out a small handmade book. For the hundredth time, he stared at the title on the cover: Ten Magic Rhymes for Annie and Jack from Teddy and Kathleen. For weeks, Jack had kept the book hidden in his drawer, wondering when he and Annie would be able to use its magic again. The book's ten rhymes were to be used on four missions, and each rhyme could be used only once. Jack and Annie had already used two rhymes on a mission in Venice, Italy. Jack, Annie rushed into Jack's room. Her eyes were shining. Bring the book. Let's go. Where? said Jack. You know where? Come on! Annie called as she ran back downstairs. Jack quickly put Teddy and Kathleen's book into his backpack. He pulled on his jacket and took off down the stairs. Annie was waiting on the front porch. Hurry! she cried. Wait! How do you know it's there? Jack said. Because I just saw it! Annie shouted. She hurried down the porch steps and crossed the yard. You saw it? Actually saw it? Yelled Jack as he followed Danny through the chilly afternoon air. Yes, yes, Annie yelled. When? Shouted Jack. Just now, said Annie. I was walking home from the library and I had this feeling, so I went and looked. It's waiting for us. Jack and Annie raced into the Frog Creek woods. They ran between the budding trees, over the fresh green moss of early spring, until they came to the tallest oak. See? Said Annie. Yes. Breathed Jack. He stared up at the magic tree house. Its rope ladder dangled above the mossy ground. Annie started climbing up. Jack followed. When they got inside, Jack pulled off his backpack. Look, a book and a ladder. Annie said. She picked up a folded ladder from the floor, and Jack picked up a book with a gold cover. Baghdad, Jack said. He showed the book to Annie. Its title was The Golden Age of Baghdad. A golden age. Said Annie, "That sounds cool. Let's go." Wait, we should read our letter first," said Jack. "Right," said Annie. She unfolded the paper. Merlin's handwriting," she said. She read aloud. "Dear Jack and Annie of Frog Creek, your mission is to journey to Baghdad of long ago and help the Caliph spread wisdom to the world. To succeed, you must be humble and use your magic wisely." Follow these. Wait, what's a caliph? Said Jack. And what's Merlin mean? Spread wisdom to the world. That's a big responsibility. I don't know, said Annie. Let me finish. She kept reading. Follow these instructions. Ride a ship of the desert on a cold, starry night. Ride through the dust and hot morning light. Find a horse on a dome. The one who sees all. In the heart of the city, behind the third wall, beneath birds who sing in the room of the tree, greet a friend you once knew and a new friend to be. Remember that life is full of surprises. Return to the tree house before the moon rises. M. This sounds pretty easy," said Annie. "No, it doesn't," said Jack. "All these instructions are so mysterious. We don't know what any of them mean. We'll find out when we get there," said Annie. But first, we have to get there. Make the wish. Okay," said Jack. He pointed to the cover of the book. "I wish we could go to the golden age of Baghdad," he said. The wind started to blow. The tree house started to spin. It spun faster and faster. Then everything was still, absolutely still. Chapter two. Nowhere. Jack felt hot. He opened his eyes. Morning sunlight was flooding into the tree house. He and Danny were wearing long robes tied with cords. They wore white headcloths and pointy slip-on shoes. Jack's backpack had turned into a leather shoulder bag. We look like characters in that book Aunt Mary gave us," said Annie. "Tales from the Arabian Nights." "Yeah, like Aladdin and Ali Baba," said Jack. Shading their eyes from the bright sunlight, Jack and Danny squinted out the window. They had landed in the spiky crown of a palm tree. It was the tallest tree in a clump of palm trees. Thirty shrubs and sparse green grass grew under the trees. 
A small spring bubbled up from the ground. Surrounding the clump of trees were miles and miles of scorching sand. This doesn't look like a golden age to me, said Annie. Yeah, and where's Baghdad? asked Jack. He picked up the research book and opened it to the first page. He read aloud. From 762 A.D. to 1258 A.D., the Arab world had a golden age. During that time, a ruler known as a caliph governed an empire that stretched for thousands of miles. The capital of the Arab empire was the city of Baghdad, an important center for learning and trade. Jack looked up. So the caliph is a ruler, he said, and he probably lived in Baghdad. Yeah, but how do we get there? asked Annie. Patience, said Jack. Remember on our last mission, we learned that we have to do things in order, one thing at a time. He read the first part of Merlin's instructions. Ride a ship off the desert on a cold, starry night. Ride through the dust and hot morning light. I wonder what a ship of the desert is, said Jack, looking up. Well, whatever it is, I'm sure we'll find it eventually, Annie said slowly, as if she were trying to sound patient. We could just sit here and keep an eye out for a big boat. Or, or what, said Jack. Maybe we could use one of Teddy and Kathleen's magic rhymes. Not yet, said Jack. Merlin said to use our magic wisely. We just got here. We used two rhymes on our last mission, and we only have eight left to divide between three. Okay, okay, Annie broke in. We can only use a rhyme when there's absolutely nothing else to do, right? Right, said Jack. So, said Annie, what do you think we should do? We could start walking, said Jack. Walk where, said Annie. Which way is Baghdad? Jack looked out the window. Beyond the palm trees, there was nothing but sand and sky. In the distance were lonely dunes. The desert was eerily silent. We could, uh, Jack couldn't think of anything else they could do. We could look in the rhyme book, he said. Jack pulled the book of magic rhymes out of his pack. He and Danny read down the table of contents together. Make a stone come alive, read Annie. We did that on our last mission. We can't do that again. It wouldn't help anyway, said Jack. He looked at other rhymes. Bend iron, he read. We've already done that too. Turn into ducks, read Annie. She looked at Jack. No, he said. Mend what cannot be mended, read Annie. Nothing needs mending, said Jack. How about this one, said Annie. Make helpers appear out of nowhere. Well, said Jack. Maybe. Come on, it's perfect, said Annie. That's where we are nowhere, and we could sure use some helpers. Okay, said Jack. I'll read the line Teddy wrote. You read Kathleen's line in her Selkie language. Okay, said Annie. She turned to the page with a rhyme. She held the book out to Jack. Jack read in a loud, clear voice. From far beyond, send helpers here. Then Annie read, Ha e bai ha e kier. The second that Annie finished to the rhyme, wind gusted in from the desert, blowing a cloud of sand through the window. The wind shook the palm trees. Sand blew into Annie's eyes. Ow! She said. Get back! Cried Jack. Jack and Annie jumped away from the window. They pressed themselves against the wall and covered their faces. Gritty sand kept blowing into the tree house. It's a sandstorm! Cried Jack. The hot sand piled into drifts all over the floor. Then the wind died down as quickly as it had started. The palm trees stopped shaking. Jack and Annie looked out the window. The air was thick with grainy dust, making it hard to see. But the sand was still. I think it's over," said Annie. "I hope so," said Jack. "Why did our magic rhyme cause a sandstorm instead of sending us helpers?" "I don't know," said Annie. "Maybe we said it wrong." Jack brushed the sand off their research book and looked up sandstorms in the index. He found the right page and read, "The season of the sandstorms begins in the desert in mid-February and continues all spring, 
Winds can blow as fast as 40 miles per hour. Sandstorms can easily cause travelers to lose their way in the desert. I don't understand, said Jack. We don't need to lose our way. We need to find our way. Just then, the sound of bells came from outside. Jack and Danny looked out the window. Through the haze, they saw four riders perched high on the humps of camels. The riders were brightly colored robes. Behind them, a dozen more camels were tied head to tail and loaded down with saddlebags. As the camels swung from side to side, bells tinkled from around their necks. Annie grinned. Helpers, she said. Chapter 3. Mamoon Annie stuck her head out the treehouse window. Hey, she called. Shh, said Jack, pulling her back in. Don't let them see us up here. It's too hard to explain the treehouse. Let's go down. Good point, said Annie. She handed Marlin's letter to Jack and started down the rope ladder. Jack grabbed his shoulder bag. He put the letter inside, then added their research book and rhyme book. He swung the leather bag across his chest and climbed down. When he stepped onto the ground, Jack twisted the rope ladder behind the tree trunk so it wouldn't be noticed. Okay, he said to Annie. Hey, Annie called again, waving. She and Jack stepped out into the open. The camel riders headed toward the palm trees. The man in the lead made his camel kneel. As he climbed off, Jack and Annie ran over to him. The man wore a long white robe. He had a black beard and stern dark eyes. Who are you? he asked, unsmiling. From where do you come? I am Annie, and this is my brother Jack, said Annie. Our home is far away in Frog Creek, Pennsylvania. I have not heard of such a place, the man said. How do you come to be here in the desert alone? Uh, Jack didn't know what to say. We were riding with our family, Annie said. We stopped to rest here. My brother and I took a nap behind these trees. When we woke up, everyone was gone. They left us by mistake. See, we have a really big family. There are many brothers and sisters. Annie, said Jack. She was saying too much, he thought. The man looked concerned. Why have they not come back for you? He said, gazing out at the desert. I hope they have not been attacked by bandits. Are there bandits around here? asked Annie. There are many bandits prowling the desert, said the man. Jack looked anxiously around at the vast sandy plain. That is why one must always travel with others, said the man. But I hope your family is safe and will return for you soon. Excuse me, Annie said politely, but who are you? How did you happen to come here? I am a merchant, the man said. My caravan was traveling from the west when we were surprised by a sudden sandstorm. It seemed to come from nowhere, but luckily it brought us to this oasis. We will rest and water our animals until the sun goes down. In the cool of the night, we will travel on to Baghdad. The caravan leader walked over to his men and spoke to them. They dismounted and started taking saddlebags off the camels. Annie turned to Jack. See, our rhyme worked, she whispered. The sandstorm was magic. It brought them here on their way to Baghdad. But how can we get them to help us, said Jack. Well, Merlin said we should be humble, so let's offer to help them, said Annie. She walked over to the caravan leader. He was filling a canvas bucket with water from a small spring. Excuse me, said Annie. We wondered if we could help you. The man gave her a quick smile. Thank you, yes. He said, if you could gather dates, it would be most appreciated. My men are very hungry. He handed Annie two large baskets. No problem, said Annie. We'll gather dates. Annie carried the baskets to Jack. Do you know what a date is? She whispered. We're supposed to gather some. I'll look it up, said Jack. With his back to the camel riders, he pulled to their research book out of his bag and looked up dates. He read... Dates are known as the fruit of the desert. They hang in bunches from date palms. People gather dates by shaking the trunk of the tree. Not only are dates an important food, but the wooden leaves of the date palm are used to make... Okay, got it, interrupted Annie, putting the baskets down. Let's start shaking the trees. Jack put the book away and looked around. For the first time, 
he noticed branches of brown fruit hanging from the trees. He grabbed hold of the nearest tree trunk. Annie grabbed the trunk from the other side. Together they shook the tree until dates began falling to the ground. In the desert heat, Jack and Annie went from tree to tree, shaking each one and gathering the dates that fell to the ground. By the time they had filled their baskets, the trees were casting long shadows over the oasis. Tired and sweaty, Jack and Annie carried their heavy baskets back to the caravan later. He was boiling water over a fire of twigs. Ah, very good, he said. Thank you, Jack and Annie. You're welcome, said Annie. What else can we do for you? You should rest from the heat now, said the man. Would you like to sit and have tea with us? Sure, said Annie. By the way, what's your name? My name is very long, the man said with a smile. You may call me Mamoon. While their camels grazed, Mamoon and his men sat on a woolen rug spread over the grass. They shared dates and tea with Jack and Annie. The dark plump fruit was sweet and chewy. The tea was strong but good. In the fiery red glow of the setting sun, Jack watched the grazing camels. He thought the humped animals looked really funny. They had knobby knees, big clumsy feet, and little ears that twitched. Some camels snapped their droopy lips as they drank water. Others gobbled down whole branches of thorn bushes without chewing. Don't the thorns hurt the camels' throats? Jack asked Mamoon. No, said the caravan leader. Their mouths are very tough. They can eat anything, sticks, bones, even our tents and saddlebags if we let them, said a young camel rider. Annie and Jack laughed. What's in your saddlebags? Annie asked. Our bags are filled with the goods from Greece, Turkey, and Syria, said Mamoon. We have many things, jewels, beads, and precious spices, such as cinnamon, pepper, and vanilla. We are taking everything to Baghdad to sell. We have to get to Baghdad too, said Annie. We have to meet with the caliph. The camel riders chuckled as if they thought Annie was making a joke. Only Mamoon did not laugh. Your family is to meet with the caliph, he said. No, said Annie. Just Jack and me. We have to help him spread wisdom to the world. Annie, warned Jack. The camel riders laughed loudly. What's so funny? Annie asked. The caliph does not meet with children, said a young man. He is the most powerful and important person in the world. Oh, said Annie, frowning. The news worried Jack too. Mamoon looked at Jack and Annie with a curious expression. Night will soon be upon us. Since your family has not yet returned, would you like to travel with us to Baghdad? He said. You have journeyed by camel this far. I trust you can ride camels the rest of the way. Sure we can, said Annie. We love camels. We do, thought Jack. Good. We love our ships of the desert too, said Mamoon. We will set sail on them soon. So that's what ships of the desert are, Annie whispered to Jack. Camels, thought Jack. Oh, brother. Chapter 4 Ships of the Desert The camel riders all silently watched the sun set over the faraway dunes. As the fiery ball slipped beneath the horizon, the desert was flooded with red light. As soon as the sun disappeared, the air grew much cooler. Mahmoud stood up. It is time to go, he said. The camel riders put out their small fire. In the glowing darkness, Mamoon helped them saddle up their animals and load them with baggage. Then Mamoon came over to Jack and Danny. You can ride those two sisters, he said, pointing to two camels kneeling in the sand. Climb on, then come to the front of the line to ride with me. Jack and Danny walked over to the two camel sisters. Each had reins hanging from her neck. Saddles made from colorful cushioning were piled high on their humps. Annie patted the wiry, tan-colored fur of one of the camels. The camel looked at Annie with big eyes and fluttered her thick eyelashes. Hey, cutie, said Annie. The other camel nuzzled Annie's neck. Hey, beauty, Annie said to the other. You want some attention, too? Cutie and beauty, said Jack. He didn't find either camel particularly cute or beautiful. Annie climbed on cutie's saddle cushion and picked up the reins. Let's ride, she said. 
Cutie rose awkwardly up from a kneeling position to a full stand. Oh, wow, said Annie, towering over Jack. She's really tall. Jack started to climb onto Beauty, but the camel caught an end of his hat cloth and began chewing it. Stop that, said Jack, pulling the cloth away from her. Beauty opened her mouth wide and flashed rows of sharp teeth. Jack drew back. Don't be afraid, said Annie. Easy for you to say, said Jack. Yours likes you. Don't worry, Beauty likes you too, said Annie. I can tell. Annie's camel began ambling toward the other camels waiting to head off into the desert. Come on, Jack. It's really fun once you're moving, she called. Fun, muttered Jack. Right. He held on to the ends of his head cloth and put his leg over Beauty's hump. The camel eyed him suspiciously. She swished her tail, slapping his back. Hey, said Jack. Jack tried to get comfortable on the saddle cushion, but Beauty spat at him and made a weird screeching sound. Quiet, said Jack. He hooked his shoulder back onto a saddle horn. When he was finally settled, Beauty turned her head and started chewing on his leather bag. No, don't, yelled Jack. He tried pulling the bag away, but Beauty played tug of war. Come on, let go, Jack said. Give it back, stupid. Do you really think she is stupid? Jack jumped. Mamoon had ridden up behind him and was watching as he tried to get his bag back from Beauty. Jack was embarrassed. Um, she won't let go of my stuff, he said. Mamoon grabbed the strap of Jack's bag. He clucked his tongue, and the camel let go. She groaned as Mamoon hooked the leather bag back onto the saddle horn. For thousands of years, camels like this one have carried people across the desert, said Mamoon. She is truly a miracle of nature. Some miracle, thought Jack. She can drink two barrels of water in ten minutes, said Mamoon, and then go for a week without drinking again. She can live many days without food, too. Really? said Jack. She is well suited to travel in the desert, said Mamoon. Her thick eyebrows protect her eyes from the glare of the sun. Her long eyelashes and the fur around her ears keep out the wind blown sand. Cool, said Jack softly. Her feet are so tough they do not feel the heat of the desert, said Mamoon, and they are so big that they keep her from sinking down into the loose sand. Hmm, said Jack. She can carry five hundred pounds of baggage on her back. Said Mamoon, and travel one hundred miles in a single day. That's a lot, murmured Jack. Mamoon tugged on the camel's reins and clucked his tongue. Beauty breathed heavily as she rose up on her long, powerful legs to her full height. Mamoon looked to Jack. We must respect her and honor her, he said. In many ways, she is superior to us. No, Jack nodded. He thought of the words of Merlin's letter. To succeed in your mission, you must be humble. He patted the camel. Good girl, Beauty. Mamoon clucked his tongue again to coax the camel forward. Perched high on his saddle, Jack rocked from side to side. He did not feel at all safe, but he stayed calm. Beauty ambled over to Cutie. The two sisters stood together and snorted. The desert sky was bright with stars. Mamoon called to his men. And the caravan started moving forward. The camels walked with a swaying motion. They moved two big feet on one side, then two big feet on the other. Jack ripped the horn of his saddle as his ship of the desert rocked from left to right. "Isn't this fun?" said Annie, rocking alongside him. "Sort of," said Jack, shivering. Actually, he wasn't having any fun at all. He felt seasick and was freezing in the night air. Also. He was worried about their mission. Would the caliph meet with them? If he did, how could they help him spread wisdom to the world? And if Baghdad was very far away, how would they ever find their way back to the tree house? Mamoon slowed his camel until he was riding between Jack and Danny. When I was a boy, I spent many cold nights in the desert, riding with my father on journeys to the west. He said, "At first, I too." Thought camels were foolish. I always longed for more blankets and for a smoother ride. I wished to be back in Baghdad in my own warm bed. Jack smiled. 
He liked the caravan leader. But over time, I have come to love the cold desert nights, said Mahmoud. Now when I am sleeping in my warm bed in Baghdad, I long to be here instead. I wish to be reading the wind and the stars. How do you read the stars? asked Annie. They have their own language, said Mamoon. At this moment, we are heading east, toward the gold star. He pointed at the sky. Jack couldn't tell which star was the gold star, but he was filled with wonder. Thousands of tiny lights twinkled in the black dome of night. There were more stars than Jack had ever imagined. Some looked close enough to touch. Mamoon started singing a song. The other camel riders joined in. Jack couldn't understand the words, but the tune was soothing. The camel seemed to sway to the music. Jack stopped worrying about how they would get back to the tree house, and he found he was actually enjoying the fresh desert air. He started to relax. Jack, Annie said softly, guess what? We just solved the first mystery in Merlin's letter. Ride a ship of the desert on a cold starry night. Yeah, said Jack happily, and it's really fun. Suddenly, a fierce shout came from the distance. Jack sat up straighter, his heart thumped. Bandits, one of the camel riders shouted. Chapter 5, Bandits. Jack looked around wildly. Dark figures and horses were galloping across the sand toward them. They were yelling and shouting. Oh no, cried Jack. What should we do? We will fight them off, said Mamoon. You and Danny take this box and ride to the dunes. Mamoon pulled a flat wooden box out of one of his saddlebags. He thrust the box into Jack's hands. Hurry, ride as fast as you can, protect it with your lives. Jack frantically tried to stuff the box into his shoulder bag, but Mamoon slapped the back of Jack's camel and she bolted forward. The reins slipped from Jack's hands. He grabbed the saddle horn with one hand and clutched the wooden box to his chest with the other. He held on for his life as Beauty galloped across the dark desert. Annie's camel ran beside Jack's. Like two racehorses, Beauty and Cutie thundered across the sand toward the distant dunes. Rocking crazily from side to side, Jack clung to the box. Slow down, he yelled. Please. It was no use. Beauty ran like the wind. She and her sister practically flew over the desert under the starry sky. Jack wanted the camels to stop, but at the same time, he wanted to get far away from the bandits. Finally, the camels began to slow their pace. Jack looked back. He couldn't see the caravan at all, and no one seemed to be following them. When the two camels reached the dunes, they began plodding around the steep hills. Once they were nestled safely between tall sand drifts, they stopped to rest. Beauty grunted. Cutie snorted. Thanks. Thanks, girls, said Annie, panting. I hope Mamoon and the others are safe from the bandits, said Jack. Me too, said Annie. What's in the box he gave us? Jack held up the flat wooden box. I don't know, he said, but Mamoon said we should protect it with our lives. Maybe it's a precious spice, said Annie. I hope it's more than that, said Jack. I'd hate to risk my life for cinnamon or pepper. Should we look, said Annie. I don't know, said Jack. Mamoon might not want us to. But don't you think we should protect it better if we knew what it was, said Annie. Maybe, said Jack. He could see Annie's point. Okay. Jack tried to open the lid of the box, but he couldn't. In the dark, his finger pressed against a keyhole. Forget it, he said. It's locked. Shh, listen, said Annie. Jack listened. He heard a high-pitched moaning sound. It sounded like music from a violin. Wafting through the dry sand dunes, the haunting music grew louder. What is that, said Jack. Uh-oh, said Annie. Now I hear something else. Jack held his breath. He heard hooves galloping over the desert. The bandits, he said. We have to hide the box, said Annie. Where, said Jack. In the sand, said Annie. She clucked her tongue and Cutie knelt down to the ground. Beauty knelt too. Jack and Annie jumped off their saddle cushions and started digging in the sand. The sound of hoofbeats grew louder and louder. Jack and Danny dug frantically. They threw sand behind them like puppies digging in the dirt. That's deep enough, said Jack. He placed the box in the hole they had dug. Then he and Danny pushed piles of sand back on top of it. When they stood up, 
Annie gasped. Look, a dark figure on a camel was silhouetted against the starlit sky. The rider was winding his way through the dunes toward them. Jack's heart nearly pounded out of his chest. Shall we use a magic rhyme? Annie asked. We don't have time, said Jack. The rider drew closer until he stopped in front of Jack and Annie. You are safe, no? He said. The moon, said Annie. Relief flooded through Jack. He laughed. Yes, we're safe, he said, and you're safe too. My men fought well, said Mamoon. The thieves fled with only a few bags of pepper and painted beads. And we kept our box safe too, said Annie proudly. She knelt and dug in the sand until she uncovered the wooden box. She handed it to Mamoon. Ah, very good, the caravan leader said. What's in the box? asked Annie. A priceless treasure, said Mamoon. I have brought it all the way from Greece, and I am taking it to Baghdad. Thank you both for guarding it with your lives. You are very special. Sure, no problem, said Jack. He still wondered what was in the box. Gold? Silver? Precious jewels? But Mamoon did not say. He put the box back into his camel saddlebag. Let us be on our way now, he said. Jack climbed on top of his kneeling camel. He clucked his tongue. He was surprised and pleased when Beauty rose up on her tall legs. We will catch up with the others in Baghdad, said Mamoon. If all goes well, we will arrive in the city in the afternoon. We must head east toward the morning sun. Mamoon rode out of the dunes. Jack and Danny followed him. As their camels rocked through the chilly dawn, daylight shimmered over the sand. Mamoon, last night we heard strange sounds in the dunes, said Annie. Like music playing. Ah, yes, said Mamoon. The whistling sands. What are the whistling sands? asked Jack. Some say it is magic, said Mamoon. But I believe that all things in nature have their reasons. That is why I like the study of science. Science says we must observe our world. We must make experiments and try to find out why things happen. We have learned the whistling is made by sands settling in the drifts. Oh, said Annie, I hoped it was magic. Learning the reasons for things is magic, said Mamoon. True knowledge brings light to the world, and that is a magical thing, no? Yes, said Jack. Annie nodded thoughtfully. I guess when you put it that way, she said. Swaying from side to side on their camels, the three riders traveled toward the dawn. As the sun rose higher in the sky, the desert grew blazing hot. A dry wind whipped through the air, making snaky patterns in the sand. Mamoon halted his camel. He looked around and frowned. What's wrong? said Jack. Are there signs of bandits? Mamoon shook his head. No, it is the desert itself that worries me now, he said. It is restless. He clucked his tongue and his camel began walking again. As they rode over the restless desert, the wind picked up loose sand and tossed it into the air. Jack and Danny lowered their heads to keep the sand from blowing into their eyes. Their headcloths flapped to the wind. More and more sand started blowing. The desert seemed alive as the sand shifted and swirled. The moon stopped again and looked about. The snaky patterns in the sand were blowing into round curly patterns. Jack heard a weird moaning sound. Is that the whistling sands again? He asked hopefully. No, said Mamoon. That is the cry of a terrible sandstorm, and it will soon be upon us.